Hi everyone and uh, welcome to a first episode of a multi-part deep dive series that I'm starting. So um, it's very special because its subject is a really, really special synthesizer. Um, and it's it's not an ordinary story. So I want to follow it up and um, yeah, see what happens and how it ends. About two, three weeks ago, an ad popped up for a Roland JD800 um, that was in a bad state and it was uh, broken and it was sold as for parts or reparation object. For about 20 years, I have pretty much uh, revered that synth. I've never owned it. The only one that I owned or still own is a Roland JD990, which is pretty much my favorite synth of all time. Uh, but the JD800 still remains this kind of mythical, elusive beast. And also, uh, a couple of serious users and really good musicians, they all say that even though JD800 and 990 are based on the same engine, that they are, in reality, when you use them as an instrument, a completely different beast, mainly because of the hands-on controls. Either way, 20 years I have been pretty much dreaming about that synth, but whenever they appear, if they appear, they are really rare. And when they do appear, the prices are way too high for what I'm comfortable to pay for that. However, this one popped up and it was extremely cheap. So it was a no brainer for me, I'm gonna get it. But there was a small problem. Uh, I am based in the southwest of Norway and uh, the ad and where it was sold was in Trondheim, which is roughly 520 kilometers from me in one direction. And uh, yeah, the guy wasn't willing to send it or was reluctant to send it. And also if it's already in a bad state and it's a massive synthesizer, if it's not packed correctly, who knows what else can happen. So I kind of decided, um, yeah, um, I'm gonna drive there. <laughs> so I kind of prepared and planned the whole thing and I made a big drive. So it's like an eight hour drive in one direction. So it was 16 hour drive. Uh, so yeah, I started driving around 6 a.m. sharp. Got there about 2.15, picked up the synth, turned around immediately and drove right back home and was home at the, a little bit before midnight. As a drive, it was really cool, but already this whole synth uh, is more than just an instrument because it's starting to have a story behind it. The day after, I then kind of picked it up and started to kind of examine what's what. Now, it was sold, uh, the description was when you turn it on, it just makes a horrible noise and that's about it. So let's see the state of the synth and uh, what did I get myself into? Okay, so here's the actual synth. At first glance it doesn't look too bad, but that's just because I dressed it or him or her up for uh, for the occasion of filming. Um, but yeah, when 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 I came to pick the synth up, there was when I finally arrived there, there was nobody to uh, nobody home, and they just left the synth in the uh, corridor uh, for me to pick it up and it was lying on the side with this patch being on top and it was broken in several pieces which you can see I've started mending it was like a jigsaw puzzle it's like piece here but somebody did a terrible terrible glue job here with some sticky tape inside it's just a complete mess if we can focus there we go so many more pieces here as well so this in by many would be considered junk but this can actually be restored and I'm gonna attempt to restore it and rebuild the missing pieces the missing sides and everything and just kind of 
return it to its uh, former glory but other than the side and the other side of course is also a big crack here a crack there this actually fell apart and it's all completely used up I mean you can see that it's not in a good state the biggest problem with this one is that unfortunately here it has been glued to the metal so whoever was doing this wasn't really careful or thoughtful about uh, about this end so of course on the sides it's cracked a big crack here missing piece there hello this is Maka she's helping me now and she's waiting for the snows to melt maybe they've melted go kitty go however when you get past the whole awful business with the uh, broken plastics the it has all of the buttons they're in good state it has all of the sliders it has all the small buttons the little dials this plays fine everything's pretty much it and there's not too many scratches on the front panel the keys themselves are nice and clean and okay and as you can see it does not have the uh, dreaded red glue dripping state but it has not been mended from the red glue either so that's another thing that definitely has to be done before it droops and ruins everything that was the first impression of the synth so then i had to actually start digging into it and see what the actual problem is and start solving it. So when I turned the scent on, uh, it was really good. Hello. Uh, when I turned the scent on, it was actually a good sign because it... Didi. <laughs> Are we through? Okay. When I turned the scent on, uh, it was a really good sign because it actually powered up normally and it just kind of, uh, yeah, I could change the programs, the LEDs responded, it, it all seemed to work correctly. However, when I plugged the output, um, either headphones or the uh, line out, it was as described, as soon as you start punching up the volume, horrible, horrible crackling digital noise was going. And um, yeah, at first you think it's something really, really bad. But then, um, yeah, I changed the program and the noise changed. I changed the program again and the noise also changed. The type of the noise and the intensity, it was always there. And then through careful listening, I kind of deduced and you can actually hear it. I, I didn't know at the time that I was going to be making these videos. So unfortunately, I didn't record it. But um, yeah, you could hear that the core of the sound was pretty clear and okay, but it was overshadowed by the effects being completely corrupt. So sure enough, I went to the effects panel, turned the dry out or the wet out all the way down, and all of the noise was push, gone. So that was really, really cool. So basically, yeah, I identified the problem, or I thought I identified the main problem. Then I kind of scoured the internet and figured out there was an obscure post about um, it maybe being the FX RAM chips. So I ordered the FX RAM chips and waited for them to arrive. Let's now check the synth out from inside and show a couple of photos of what was actually the issue. Okay, so um, since I was completely unsure what's gonna happen and what's the problem with the synth, initially I thought it was these guys. You can only see a few of them, but there's six of them. And these are effects uh, RAM chips, I think. And I read on one of the forums there's an obscure small uh, uh, post by a guy on Don Solari's forum. Somebody was complaining about the same problem. Um, that when the effects are used, you get a horrible distorted sound. And the guy said, just exchange FX RAM chips and you're good to go. So I ordered the replacement chips and waited with the whole thing. And when the replacement chips arrived, I kind of wanted to inspect the cold solders. And that's when I actually discovered the real problem. Now, because it was all happening the way it was, 
I didn't take the video during the process, which I'm kind of pissed off, because it would have been a lot of fun to actually see this, because now it's kind of uh, done, as you can see. But I'm gonna try, and as you can see here that we have uh, uh, glued, hot glued the section where I attached the two wires, and they go from a certain leg on the, this is the effects processor, so they go from one leg, to the corresponding leg of the FX processor and the other one to the other one. So the first thing that I had to determine was I kind of figured out uh, do the FX chips have connection between them. So I went with the multimeter and saw that um, you know the first pin to the first pin of every other chip works and all 18 pins they work. So basically that immediately kind of said that the FX part of the ROM chips works fine. However, then I started tracing uh, and I could focus only on this guy here because he is the one who transmits and is connected to the rest of them. The, he's the only one who has a direct connection to the actual FX chip. So then I went, it was just a matter of tracing each pin to these guys here. The rest of them are, the rest of the CPU goes somewhere else. But this block of pins here is responsible for the FX RAM. And so I traced it and kind of wrote down what's what because the original repair service repair manual was very difficult to read. Um, and I kind of figured that it's these two and it was exactly where the corrosion and that weird gunk was on those pins and on the board. And if you can see here, and you can definitely see on the photos, but you can see here as well, these two are like burnt out. It, it's kind of strange. They, they're, they're supposed to be a link here. This is not empty, even though it might look empty, but you probably should be able to see that there is a trace line underneath that blackness. So uh, it came down to then just a simple, <laughs> simple matter of soldering on a wire, carefully soldering a wire onto just one of these small guys without touching any of the other ones and going, then it's much easier to solder to these larger pins. But this was very, very tricky and I can just give you a tip what worked for me and it really, really worked well. I used a toothpick um, to get a tiny, tiny, tiny like literally just a sliver of uh, flux and I just put tiny bit of flux on the top and on the side of the two pins that I wanted to uh, solder. Then I used a relatively cold um, soldering iron, uh, 300 Celsius, and um, I would tin it with a tiny bit of uh, tin, just a, not, not a huge blob, just the very, very, very slimmest sliver. And then I would simply touch the very tip here and here. And because of the flux, the tin immediately just goes onto the pin itself or, or the leg itself. And it becomes very nice and shiny. And that was really good for preparation. Then I used the same kind of technique for the wires. They were of course pre-tinned, but I would dip the tinned end of the wire into the flux and then just put it next to the wire, next to the leg of the CPU where I need it and simply touch and hold for two seconds maximum uh, the iron and then let go. Uh, of course it didn't work from the first. For, for the green one it worked immediately and it worked really well. So the testing method is of course you once you've connected it, you have to test it rigorously, again, with the multimeter, go through the pins and see if there's a short somewhere or not. It has to be a clean pin. If it's not, uh, it has to be a clean solder. If it's not, you have to desolder it, do the preparation again and go again. Um, so the first one, I was lucky and it went brilliantly immediately. It just went whoop to the leg. The second one, because they are right next to each other, you can see how close this is. I can't really get any closer because I don't have a macro lens, but this is, here's the reference. My finger and thickness of a really thin uh, um, toothpick. So really, really small. 
Um, so that took four tries, three tries. I, on the third try, I, was, I thought that was good, but on the measuring, I saw that there was a link and that there was a short somewhere, so I desoldered it. And then in the end, I was able to actually just get it done right. Now, why the hot glue? Well, without the hot glue, they are just sticking uh, out and I knew that I had to bend the wires down so that they don't touch anything else and that I wanted to secure these wires. And my fear was because the link is so small and so thin, I know soldering is, solder is good and I know that I prepared it well, but my fear was that when I bend it, that they're gonna pop off and I really didn't want to do that again. So I kind of, you know, bite the bullet and I, you know, put a little gunk of hot glue here. Of course, hot glue is not uh, conductive and it just kind of protects this whole area from any further craziness. Then it was a simple matter of reattaching the wires to the corresponding pins and making sure that I actually have, before I put the hot glue, I made sure that I have a connection from each FX RAM down to the pins of the chip. And then I knew that the connection was reestablished. Then I put the hot glue on and it worked. <laughs> so this is the actual fix that I had to do. So something happened with these two that ate away the connection and a little bit of the board. So it just kind of went above and got it connected to the FX RAM here and it just worked brilliantly. But then I noticed that um, there were actually two problems with uh, with the synth itself. One was this, this was the most obvious problem and the most difficult one to fix. Um, and the other one came a little bit later upon testing everything. After the effects were fixed, I was super happy because it was a really tricky fix and I didn't know if I was going to be able to do it or not. I've never done anything that fiddly and small before. However, once I started playing it, another problem surfaced which was much, much more subtle than this um, effects problem. And it was that on certain patches, when you press certain keys of certain velocity, you would get almost like a um, like a broken signal and kind of like a weird signal trail. So I did the um, diagnostic checks and uh, yeah, ROM checked out okay, ROM 1, ROM 2 checked out okay, but ROM 3 was NG, which is not good. That was a relief. Yeah, that actually fit because presets in JD can have four uh, parts, if you will, and each one can use a different PCM sample. And basically, if uh, parts one, two, three are using uh, samples that are okay, and part four is using the corrupt one, which is triggered only at a certain velocity or something, then you would actually get that problem. So I opened it up again and kind of take a closer look at that part, and let's see what happened there. Once I had um, the FX problem sorted, I noticed that uh, even though the effects were now clean, there was still a, a, a kind of really weird rustling sound on certain presets. When I did the ROM diagnostic, the, the wave ROM diag diagnostics, it says uh, ROM 1 and 2 okay, 3 was not good. And I was a little bit confused and it's like, this is ROM, this is 1 and 2, where is 3? I mean, obviously I consider that this whole thing here is just the wave ROM card, but that's not the case. These connectors here, and you can see underneath here, these pins over there, they are actually, there's a ROM 3 chip of waveforms, wave ROM 3 chip is underneath here. So, Obviously there was something with the connection here. I reset all of these and then when I tried to reset this guy over here I saw that somebody pulled by the jack and these are really specific. They're not meant to be taken off and if you do take them off you have to use a, a screwdriver or a IC remover tool and then be really gentle and kind of loose them up because it just uh, it has metal connectors inside that kind of you have to clamp the wire inside. It's a really strange connector. I don't know why it's used. 
But anyway, somebody tried to pull it off and when they pulled it off, they ripped off all of the wires inside and then just kind of pushed it back in. So when I just even moved this, there was just a jumble of wires in there and I was so shocked. I'm, I'm, I'm so sad that I didn't take a photo of that, but I was so shocked when I saw that that I just kind of like, okay, that's the first thing to do. So what I did was then I made a clean cut, uh, separated all of these, thinned, uh, thinned the wires and they're really small and I thinned them because I really wanted this to be a secure connection and that it lasts. So I then knotted them through this connector, which isn't an easy job. And uh, finally, when that was done, then I added some more hot glue all around here so that the same problem doesn't happen again. I slotted it back in, cleaned these babies up, and when I did the, the self-test, then the third ROM was now testing as okay as well and more importantly both issues any kind of distortion was gone and this baby started to sing again which was a wonderful 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 moment after doing the complete checkup uh, this is the entire list of things that have to be done so basically uh, the number one issue was the effects noise and that's why um, and basically the combination of effects noise and ROM3 not good issue um, they were in combination uh, creating uh, so much noise even when there was no notes on that the synth was completely unusable hence it was sold for parts and also it was abused on the side however this is the list of the issues that I uh, that the testing uh, self-diagnostic turned up uh, effects noise was the effects chip connection itself which I showed and that is now fixed ROM 3 not good that was the bad wires that were ripped apart and that is now fixed uh, and further testing showed that the following issues also have to be done bender modulation is not working at all and also the bender there's no pitch up it just works on the pitch down uh, LFO 1 type wave shape waveform type button doesn't work at all there's no budging uh, I checked all check all the sliders uh, check all the buttons we've done that we've checked all the buttons we've checked all the sliders and buttons small navigation and large we checked the pitch pots and we checked the waveform encoder so um, then we have reconstruction of the left and right side panels preventing the red glue issue and check the display connection for because i noticed that the display has one vertical line that's missing and it's not displayed and that's usually um, a bad connection or a cold solder so this also i will have to check but for starters the main thing was to get these two points done because that determines if the synth is alive or not and now it's definitely alive and these things are just cosmetics and kind of fine-tuning and making it shine and uh, really really be pretty With the main problems fixed um, I was able to actually play a JD-800 after 20 years for the first time in my life and uh, I was not prepared to be blown away that much. It's, it's really hard to describe what kind of experience the entire instrument as an instrument gives you. My JD-800 works! It's a wonderful thing to bring something back from, you know, somebody discarded it and just wanted to throw it away or sell it for parts, which they did. It has broken side, it has been completely abandoned and neglected. I mean, the glue on the sides and there's so much work left to do but it still has life left and a lot of life and a lot of music left in it and it's already a really special instrument for me. The initial time when I actually just powered it up and started tweaking and testing if it works, then I gradually just went into uh, playing it, then creating the patches and before I knew it, it was four hours gone. 
like this. The idea is now to fix the rest of the things and kind of tweak it, all the sliders, buttons, the pitch band mod, the LCD display maybe, and just make it tip top on the inside so that the machine actually works properly and all the keys as well. I decided that in this process, uh, I want to make it a custom JD800 because I think it really deserves a complete new rebirth because in my mind somebody just discarded it as, uh, as for that and it's still alive and I just want to bring it back up and make it shine again. So that's the idea. I'm going to post a couple of photos now, just a couple of ideas of uh, color templates that I'm thinking between and it would be interesting to see if you guys in the comments can just say which ones you prefer from the ones that were listed. That would actually help out a lot. Yeah, hope you enjoyed this episode. The next time we're gonna dig in deeper and clean all the stuff and hopefully fix the rest of them. So the idea behind the series is to um, yeah, document the journey uh, of restoration and rebuilding of this wonderful, wonderful instrument. Thanks for joining me, hope you enjoyed it, and see you next time. Bye!